Hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon or good evening from my side depending on which in which part of the world you currently are. Uh, hope you're doing fine and I'm extremely happy to be with you here today at Scottish Summit uh, and you should be too as this is one of the truly greatest events uh, this year. Uh, today I want to talk about Power BI internals and share with you some best practices to keep your data model size in optimal condition. I believe it's a quite important topic from many different perspectives, therefore I really hope that you will enjoy the session and get some useful takeaways once we are done. At the very beginning, big big thanks to all of our sponsors. As you might assume, it's really hard to keep the pace in these uh, challenging times and those folks from the companies you see on your screens put their resources in supporting uh, the event. Therefore, once again, big shout out and thanks to all folks from Script Runner, uh, DQ Global, Proximo 3, Red Spire, Agilisys, and Hitachi Solutions. Before we start, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but since last almost five years, I live in a wonderful city of Salzburg in Austria, where I work as a business intelligence developer in company called ITSP Services. Uh, living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen my nickname Data Mozart. Uh, as you probably all know, uh, Salzburg is worldly famous as a birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. That's why my motto is make music from your data. I'm regularly blogging at data-mozart.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter, so feel free to ping me or connect if you like. A uh, few more sentences about me. I have multiple year experience working with uh, uh, different data products, predominantly, predominantly with Microsoft Data Platform. Started with SQL Server, then brushed myself with uh, analysis services, multidimensional SQL Server reporting services, integration services, and most recently, if you consider last almost four years as recent, with Power BI, which I'm a big fan of. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer and Certified Data Analyst. Privately, I'm a father of two little kids and true football and Barca fan, as you can conclude looking at the photo on your screen. Uh, what should you expect today from this session? Well, I like to tell the stories, so don't expect a normal session today. I want to tell you a story, a story about a wonderful tool called Power BI, and in my story you will be a real hero and our villain is the non-optimal data model size. As in most stories, heroes win in the end, so you will see how to overcome challenges brought to us by evil data model, resolve different issues along the road, and finally make your Power BI development a real fairy tale. Therefore, make yourself comfort com comfortable, uh, take a seat, grab a coffee or some other refreshment, and listen carefully to my story. I guess you all know the story about Titanic. Uh, if you don't know, you should watch the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Wait, what? Ah, you already watched it? Sure, who hasn't? Uh, Titanic was the most powerful, most beautiful, most everything, largest ship of all the time. And people were in awe looking at this brilliant piece of human's creativity. But Titanic's story uh, ended almost before it started. After only four days of voyage from Southampton to New York City, in the early morning hours uh, in April 12, uh, 12, uh, 1912, Titanic hardly hit one of the many icebergs in the Atlantic Ocean. At first look, it didn't seem like something that can transform the greatest engineering achievement into a historical tragedy when more than 1,500 people lost their lives. However, Titanic didn't sink because it hit the tip of an iceberg. The main culprit was under the surface, in the cold ocean water, where basically the largest part of this iceberg resided. Titanic received a shot without a chance to recover and in less than three hours it was on its way to the ocean's bottom and placed in many books and movies as well. Now you're probably asking yourselves what on earth story of Titanic has with Power BI. But if we think a little deeper, we can think of Power BI as an iceberg in the cold ocean's waters. A tip of an iceberg is your Power BI dashboard or the report itself. I mean, doesn't that look beautiful, like a snowy mountain straight in the middle of the water and under this awesome blue sky? 
all tourists look with admiration in this piece uh, of art of the nature and they are making photos and videos everything but what they don't know is that the real thing is under the surface uh, the biggest and strongest part of this iceberg which provides stability and steadiness for the visible part and this part underneath consists of multiple individual but cohesive parts which enable above the surface part to stand strong and shine as I said, there are multiple individual portions down there. If you think for a moment here as a Power BI developer, you will see different concepts, architectures and techniques that might makes your Power BI dashboard shine. If you don't understand and apply those concepts on the right, such as data profiling, data modeling and data shaping in a proper way, your Power BI, your Power BI report will experience the same fate as Titanic. Same applies if you don't dedicate uh, deserved attention to architectures and techniques on the left. Always keep in mind that all these, but also many more concepts, many more core concepts, is what enable your Power BI dashboard to perform in the most optimal way. Therefore, never underestimate the importance of understanding all those invisible things uh, under the surface. Today we will focus on learning and understanding VertiPack engine, but you, sh you should also spend uh, your time learning other key concepts uh, listed here. In the end, you can create Power BI reports that work without knowing these underlying concepts at all. But there is a huge difference between Power BI reports that just work and Power BI reports that work efficiently. Now, in order to follow the story, you need to have some skills before you start. For example, you can't read the book in Chinese if you don't know Chinese. So, we are talking about prerequisites now. Uh, and in regard to this session prerequisites, I need to stress a few things. Uh, first, this is a 300 level session, which means advanced level. So, it assumes that you have some, not just basic, but intermediate knowledge and experience with Power BI and data modeling in general. That being said, I expect from you to have at least basic understanding about relational databases, their structure, in terms of how the data is being stored in the database and to be able to distinct, of course, between rows and columns. Of course, knowledge of Power BI is also necessary to follow along because I will often uh, refer to some things related to a Power BI development that I assume you are familiar with. So, as we agreed that I'm telling you a story, I mean, we didn't agree, but I hope that you are fine with that. Uh, I've intentionally avoided calling this part agenda. Instead, let's think of it as a contents of the short book. So, what's in for you today? Uh, we will learn what is VertiPack, how it stores the data, what kind of algorithms VertiPack applies to compress the data, and how we as uh, Power BI developers can help VertiPack to build an optimal data model for us. Finally, we will need to leave our book on the shelf shortly, pick our toolboxes, go out, get our hands dirty and dig deep under the hood of Power BI. Uh, during the demo, I will show you on a real life example how I managed to reduce uh, Power BI data model size by a whopping 90% just by sticking with few basic but extremely important rules that we will talk about today. Okay, here we are. Once upon a time in a far, far away land, I'm just kidding, my story doesn't start like that. My story starts with a simple question to you. Have you ever wondered what makes Power BI so fast and powerful when it comes to performance? So powerful that it performs complex calculations over millions, sometimes even billions of rows in a blink of an eye. Maybe you wondered but couldn't find the proper answer. Perhaps you were just seeing the tip of an iceberg. Therefore, today we will discover what is under the surface of Power BI, how your data is being stored, compressed, uh, queried, and finally brought back to your report. Once we are done, uh, I hope that you will get a better understanding of the hard work happening in the background and appreciate the importance of creating an optimal data model in order to get maximum performance from the Power BI engine. Okay, going back to our starting point, what is a VertiPack? Uh, again, you will need to wait a little bit for an answer. Before we come to it, we should mark the line between row store versus columnar databases. Uh, VertiPack is a columnar database. As you can see in this illustration, columnar databases stores and compresses data in a whole different way compared to traditional row store databases. 
Columnar databases are usually implemented in large analytical systems as they are optimized for vertical data scanning, which means that every column has its own structure and is physically separated from other columns. Another important distinction in order to understand what is VertiPack is to understand uh, the difference between formula engine and storage engine. Uh, as you can notice in this illustration taken from the book uh, The Definitive Guide to DAX by Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, Formula Engine accepts the request, uh, processes it, generates the query plan and finally executes it. Storage Engine pulls the data out of tabular model to satisfy the request issued within the query generated by the Formula Engine. Storage Engine works in two different ways in order to retrieve requested data. This part here, VertiPack, which is the focus of our session today. Uh, VertiPack keeps the snapshot of the data in memory and this snapshot can be refreshed from time to time from the original data source. As I said, this part of the architecture will be our main focus today. Uh, on the opposite, direct query doesn't store any data. It just forwards the query straight to the data source for every single request. We will also talk about the direct query today, but without going deep into details. Okay, uh, Formula Engine represents the brain of Power BI. As I already stressed, Formula Engine accepts the query and since it's able to understand DEX, and by the way MDX too, but it is out of the scope of this session, it translates DEX into a specific query plan which consists of physical operations that uh, needs to be execu execu executed in order to get the results back. Uh, those physical operations can be joins between multiple tables, uh, filtering conditions or aggregations. It's important to know that Formula Engine works in a single threaded way, which means that requests to Storage Engine are always being sent sequentially. So let's reiterate once more through the whole process that occurs within Formula Engine. So first step is that Formula, uh, formula Engine accepts the request, then it processes the request, next in the line is generation of the query plan, and finally it executes the generated query. Once the query been generated and executed by the Formula Engine, Storage Engine comes into the scene. Uh, since it physically goes through the data stored within the tabular model, which is a VertiPack, or goes directly to a different data source, like SQL Server for example, if you're using direct query storage mode, we can think of Storage Engine as muscles of Power BI. When it comes to specifying the Storage Engine for the table, there are three possible options to choose from. Uh, these three options are Import Mode, Direct Query Mode and Dual Mode. As opposed to Formula Engine that doesn't support parallelism, Storage Engine can work asynchronously. So let's first briefly introduce import mode, which is the most common way to store the data when working with Power BI. Uh, that being said, import mode is based on VertiPack and table data is being stored in memory as a snapshot. Finally, uh, this snapshot of data can be refreshed periodically. Uh, frequency of this uh, uh, data refresh uh, depends on your, on your business needs. It can be once per hour, once per day, whatever. Uh, when using direct query mode, data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. Uh, that means that data resides in its original source before, during and after the query execution. Finally, dual mode represents just a simple combination of the previous two options, so combination of import mode and direct query mode. Uh, data from the table is being loaded to a memory, but at the query time it can be also retrieved directly from the source. As we drawn a big picture previously, let me explain in more details what VertiPack does in the background uh, to boost performance of our Power BI reports. When we choose import mode for our Power BI tables, VertiPack performs the following actions. So first, it reads the data source and transforms data into a columnar structure. After that, it encodes and compresses data within each of those columns. Next step is to establish a dictionary and index for each of the columns. After that, it will prepare and establish relationships. And finally, VertiPack computes all calculated columns and calculated tables and compress them. 
how Vertipack stores the data. Uh, as you may recall from the previous part of the session, two main characteristics of Vertipack are that Vertipack is a columnar in-memory database. So Vertipack applies different types of compression to each of the columns independently. That's, that's important to know. Choosing the optimal compression algorithm based on the values in that specific column. Uh, compression, compression is being achieved by encoding the values within the column. But before we dive deeper into a detailed overview of uh, different encoding techniques, I just want you to keep in mind that this architecture is not exclusively related to Power BI. Uh, in the background is a tabular model which also works uh, under the hood of Analysis Services Tabular and Excel Power Pivot. Let's now examine the encoding types which Vertipack applies in order to compress the data. Uh, first is a value encoding, then hash encoding or dictionary encoding and finally run length encoding or RLE abbreviated. Uh, now we will go into more details regarding each of these encoding types. Value encoding is the most desirable encoding type since it works exclusively with integers and therefore requires less memory space than for example when working with uh, text values. How this looks in reality? Uh, let's say we have a column with uh, containing a number of phone calls per day and the value in this column varies from 4000 to 5000. Uh, what the Vertipack would do is to find the minimum value in this range, which is in our example 4000, and set this minimum value as a starting point. Then it will calculate the difference between this value and all the other values in the column, storing this difference as a new value. Uh, as you may notice, using this, this encoding type, we managed to save 3 bits per one row. And at first glance, 3 bits per value might not look like a significant saving. But if you multiply this by millions or even billions of rows, I think you will start to appreciate the amount of memory saved uh, using value encoding. Hash encoding is probably the most used compression type by a VertiPack. Uh, using hash encoding, Vertipack creates a dictionary of the distinct values within one column and afterward replaces real values with index values from the dictionary. Again, let's take a look at the example to better understand the concept. Uh, as you may spot here, Vertipack identified distinct values within the subject column, built a dictionary by assigning indexes to those values and finally stored index values as pointers to real values. I assume you are aware that uh, integer values require way less memory space than text, so that's the logic behind the type, this type of uh, data compression. Additionally, by being able to build dictionary for any data type, Vertipack is practically data type independent. This brings us to another key takeaway. Uh, no matter if your column is of text, uh, float or big integer data type, from Vertipack perspective, it's all the same. It needs to create a dictionary for each of those columns, which implies that all these columns will provide the same, exactly the same performance, both in terms of speed and memory space allocated. Of course, by assuming that there is no big difference between dictionary sizes between those columns. So it's a myth that the data type of the column affects its size within the data model. Uh, it affects only dictionary size, not column size itself. On the opposite, uh, the number of distinct values within the column, which is known as cardinality, uh, has most influence on uh, column memory consumption. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, a uh, third algorithm, RLE, uh, run length decoding, creates kind of a mapping table containing ranges of repeating values, that way avoiding to store every single repeated value separately. Again, let's take a look at the example to, have to, under to better understand this concept. Uh, in real life, Vertipack will not store those start values here. I put it here for the sake of clarity, but uh, uh, it stores only these count uh, values because it's smart enough and can quickly calculate where the next node begins just by summing uh, the previous values. As powerful as it might look at first glance, uh, RLE algorithm is highly dependent on the ordering within the column. If the data is stored the way you see in our example, like you see many repeating 
values. Then new bucket starts again with many repeating values. Then another one with repeating values. In those circumstances, RLE will perform great. However, if your data buckets are smaller and rotate more frequently, then run length decoding would not be an optimal solution. One more thing to keep in mind regarding RLE, in reality, uh, Vertipack doesn't store the data exactly the way it is shown in the illustration. So first, it performs hash encoding and creates a dictionary of the subjects, and then it applies uh, RLE algorithms. So the final logic, of course, in its most simplified way, would be something like this, you can see on your screens. So basically, uh, run length decoding occurs after hash encoding in those scenarios when Vertipack thinks that it makes sense to compress data additionally. So when data is ordered in that way that RLE would achieve better compression than uh, using uh, hash encoding ex exclusively. Let me just briefly iterate through the process of data compression for a specific column. So first step is Vertipack scans sample of rows from the column and if the column data type is not an integer, it will look no further and it will use hash encoding. If the column is of integer data type, some additional parameters are being evaluated. For example, if the numbers in this sample linearly increase, uh, Vertipack will assume that it is probably a primary key column and it will choose value encoding for this column. If the numbers in this uh, in this range uh, are close, are reasonably close to each other. So like in our example with four to 5,000 phone calls per day, uh, Vertipack will use value encoding. Uh, on the other hand, when values fluctuate significantly within this range, for example, between 1,000 and 1 million, then value encoding uh, would not make sense and Vertipack will apply the hash algorithm instead. However, this is important. Uh, no matter how smart Vertipack is, it can also make some bad decisions uh, based on incorrect assumptions. Therefore, sometimes it can happen that Vertipack makes a decision about which algorithm to use based on the sample data, but then some outlier pops up and Vertipack needs to re-encode the column from scratch. If you use our previous example for the number of phone calls per day, and let's imagine that Vertipack scanned the sample and chose to apply value encoding. Then after processing 10 million rows, all of a sudden it found 500,000 value. It can be an error or whatever. Now Vertipack will reevaluate the choice and it can decide to re-encode the column uh, from scratch using the hash algorithm instead of uh, value encoding. Surely that would impact the whole process in terms of time needed for reprocessing. Here is the list of parameters in order of their, their importance that Vertipack considers when choosing which algorithm to use. Uh, first one, as already mentioned, is cardinality or number of distinct values in the column. Then data distribution in the column, which means that column with many repeating values can be better compressed than one containing frequently changing values. That's as you saw uh, because RLE algorithm can be applied on top of hash algorithm. After that, number of rows in the table, and finally, column data type, which impacts only dictionary size. Okay, so few more uh, concepts uh, to, uh, you, we need to absorb few more theoretical concepts in order to understand what is going on uh, under the hood. First one is relationships. Uh, once the DAX query been generated by the formula engine, uh, storage engine enters the stage and starts its physical work in order to satisfy the request. Uh, relationships play a big part in this process. They enable quicker transfer of the filter context between related tables. And the most important thing to keep in mind regarding relationships is the higher the cardinality of the column that makes part of the relationship, the higher cost of that relationship is. When cardinality of the relationship exceeds 1 million, that's some kind of tipping point, users can notice lower performance in the report. So if you identify relationships within your data model that have cardinality above this threshold, maybe you should start thinking of possible ways uh, to optimize this. One of the reasonable solutions could be creating pre-aggregated tables with different levels of granularity, so you avoid expensive relationships at the query time. 
Uh, now that we know what are the roles of formula engine and storage engine within tabular model, let's talk about materialization. Uh, materialization is step uh, in the query execution process typical for a columnar database. So whenever formula engine sends the query to a storage engine, a uh, storage engine will physically go through the data and return uh, uncompressed table that contains requested data. The keyword here is uncompressed. Uh, this special memory storage, uh, temporary storage, is called data cache and it represents the materialization of the data that will be absorbed later by, by Formula Engine. It's important to know that both VertiPack and Direct Query produce uh, these temporary data cache structures. You should be aware that there are two types of materialization. Late materialization, which occurs in those situations when storage engine produces one single data cache with exactly the same cardinality as produced by a DAX query. On the other hand, when storage engine generates multiple data caches or when one data cache has higher cardinality than one generated by a DAX query, we are talking about early materialization. Uh, the main advantage of late materialization basically is that formula engine gets already prepared data while with early materialization it needs to perform additional stuff such as uh, joining or aggregating which implies that the end users can experience slower queries in some circumstances. The key takeaway here is whenever possible push most of the workload to storage engine as that will reduce materialization and consequentially formula engine would have to cope with less complex tasks. Finally, let's talk about aggregations. Aggregations are nothing more than reorganized versions of the source table. So you can have multiple different tables related to the same original table. By pre-aggregating data on different levels of granularity, we can help storage engine to work faster and scan the data in more efficient way. Applying different aggregations Basically, we are reducing the amount of data, basically reducing the, no the number of rows and columns. If you take a look at my example, my row table contains uh, 7,346 uh, records for chats between July 9th and July 10th of 2017. Now, if I pre-aggregate data and count number of chats per specific subject, my aggregated table will only have 45 rows. So if my users need to analyze data per date and, uh, and chat subject, having this kind of prepared table in advance will make the storage engine, engine's job much easier and it can retrieve the data much faster. One important thing to keep in mind regarding aggregations, they don't have any impact on optimization of the complex DAX calculations. They are just enabling storage engine to work more efficient and reduce the time needed to execute the queries. Uh, one more thing which is important to know is that aggregations work only with native columns from your data model. In other words, you can't perform aggregations on calculated columns. In reality, you don't need to apply aggregations on each fact table. They make sense with VertiPack uh, only for extremely large tables, for example, few hundred millions or even billions of rows. So finally, be careful when creating aggregations as each mistake can prove costly because if not defined in proper way, aggregations will produce uh, incorrect results in the report. Uh, moreover, having aggregations will require additional effort for data model maintenance. Okay, I believe we laid a solid theoretical background for the things that come now and it's time to as I promised, to get our hands dirty and see how all of these work in reality. Uh, so this demo is based on a real use case which I faced during the last year. Uh, the problem was with the size of PBIX file on our report server. File size dramatically grown since the report had been introduced, so I was involved in trying to find a solution. Uh, just to stress one thing before we proceed further for this demo, I've created a four separate PBIX files each of them representing one single phase in the data model size optimization. Why, why, did, I, uh, why I did that? Uh, we don't need to work on one single file and wait for Power BI to apply all changes we made during the process, as in some cases uh, it takes a while to reload the data and recreate the data model. Ok, 
Okay, I've put just a plain, let me show you the, the starting point, I've put just a plain card visual showing total number of records in, in my fact table in each of those files so you can see that data accuracy is not being violated by applying various development steps. So I slightly simplified data model for our demo excluding some of dimension tables but you will get the point anyway. So here is our data model. I have one fact table containing uh, data about uh, chats performed by, by our customer support department and I left here two dimension tables. So my fact table I will show you now. Okay, so it has around 9.3 million rows. It's nothing special in terms of volume. I mean Power BI should be able to cope with that without any problems. Uh, the, the main thing here is that all tables were imported in Power BI as it is, without any additional optimization or transformation. So just simple checking the table names and import mode. To be able to follow what is going on with our data model size, I will use DAX Studio. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, DAX Studio is a fantastic free tool created by Darren Gosbel, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari. It has really a whole bunch of very handy and useful features that I will basically need another 60 minute session just to talk about them. In any case, if you are working with Power BI on a day to day basis, you should definitely start using Deck Studio. Believe me, it will make your life much easier and it will boost your productivity. And uh, I can go to Deck Studio directly from Power BI desk desktop. If I go to external tools, I can click on Deck Studio and it will open and automatically uh, connect to my data model within Power BI Desktop. Short introduction on the left hand side you can see here you can see all the tables from your data model. If you ask yourself uh, which are those tables with these silly names containing bunch of uh, characters we will come to that later. I will explain everything I promise. Those are just just for the sake of clarity now, those are hidden date tables that Power BI automatically created for us. In any case, uh, one of my favorite features within DAX Studio is a VertiPack Analyzer tool and VertiPack Analyzer tool will help us to see the numbers behind our data model. Uh, VertiPack Analyzer tool just collects uh, data from various uh, dynamic management views and you can also use SQL Server Management Studio for example to query, to query uh, DMVs and get data about your data model, but you will probably find it in much more readable and understandable form within VertiPack Analyzer. Now before I open uh, VertiPack Analyzer, let me show you just one more thing. Uh, here, let me show you, okay. So this is our starting point and I want you to remember this number. So our starting point is 771 megabytes. That's the size of our PBIX file. So, but that's not the whole truth. Uh, the truth is even worse. It's not just 771 megabytes that burns our memory. Since you need to calculate some other stuff uh, uh, when you calculate total memory consumption. So it's PBIX file, then dictionary size, also column and user defined hierarchies and relationships within your data model. Now, if I open, uh, if I open uh, VertiPack Analyzer, I'm going to Advanced tab here on the top and I will click on View Metrics button. Okay, it establishes connection to my data model and I can see all of my tables uh, here in this, in this uh, view. I can see the cardinality of the table, I can see the column size, dictionary size, which encoding types VertiPack applied, etc, etc. And this is also pretty handy feature to see how much space in terms of percentage specific table uh, consumes within uh, the data model. If I click on this small arrow next to a table name, I can expand specific table and see all these metrics for, for columns, for individual columns. And I see the column size, the dictionary size, which encoding types uh, were applied etc etc. So if I go now to this summary tab here I can see that the total size of my data model is 1.86 gigabytes. 
1.86 gigabytes. That really hurts. And we haven't even interacted with the report. So let's see what we can do to optimize our data model. Let's take a first, let's take first a look at our data model. And here we can see what is the memory footprint for each of our tables and columns, as I said. That being said, do I, uh, do I really need here both source ID and chat ID columns? Both with maximum cardinality, because they contain unique values. Uh, source ID is just a primary key from the source system and chat ID is just a surrogate key from uh, my data warehouse. So in any case, I don't need both of them. I will go back to Power BI Desktop and I will under transform data, I will remove this source ID column. Okay, so let's go to our fact table and let's remove our source ID column. Here it is. Remove, hit close and apply, and let's wait for a few seconds for Power BI to apply those changes. Okay, that was fast. I will again click on view metrics to refresh the connection to a data model. And now if we go to summary, I can see that now my data model size is 1.54 gigs. So by removing just one unnecessary column, we saved more than 300 megabytes. So let's go back to, to our most expensive table and see what else can be done. Uh, do we really need both date TM starts and date TM start UTC columns? Date TM start is a, a information when chat started in original time zone and UTC is just converted to UTC, of course. So in any single scenario, we don't need both of those columns. We can use UTC and then later uh, in the report itself do some calculations if necessary. So I will remove this day TM start column. Basically, yeah, uh, uh, what's even worse, they both go to a second level precision, so they are date time data type. Uh, other than that, uh, session refer and refer columns also has have very high cardinality, more than 1 million, and they can't be optimally compressed uh, uh, as they are text columns. So I check with my report users if they need any of those columns or maybe only one of them. And I've got a confirmation that they don't perform any kind of analysis of those columns. So why on earth should we bloat our data model with them? Another strong candidate for removal is the last edit date column, which just uh, shows the date and time when the record was uh, last time edited in the data warehouse. So again, checked with my users. They didn't even know that this column exists. Also, one more thing, chat variables, bunch of JSON records imported as it is without any additional transformations. So, in, in, in any case, if someone needs to do some kind of analysis over this column, that needs to be prepared and transformed before imported to Power BI. So, let's go back to Power BI Desktop again and let's remove those additional columns. So let me open again my fact table. Okay, here it is. I will remove date TM start. Then I will remove referer, session referer. Then I will remove uh, what else I found last edit date. And finally, chat variables. Okay, let's remove all those columns and hit again close and apply. So let's see the results now in Deck Studio. Let's wait for a few seconds for Power BI to apply all those changes and refresh our connection in Deck Studio to see the changes to our data model size. Okay, it needs some time. So basically checking which columns are unnecessary and unused in your reports uh, should always be your starting point when you're performing data model size optimization. Uh, I will show you later on a, on a, on a really funny and entertaining example uh, how this looks like, but just keep in mind that uh, always start with that. Do I need this column? Do my users need this column? Uh, talk with them and yeah, ask what they really need in their reports uh, before just putting everything in there. Okay, so it takes some, some time to, to
to create the connection. That's why I prepared uh, our PBIX files. And uh, once it's done, it's done, okay. Thanks, Power BI. Go to view metrics. And if I go now to summary, I can see that our data model size is now 660 megabytes. So we shrink two thirds the size of our data model by just removing a few unnecessary columns. So when I, when I said that it's important to keep in mind that uh, only to keep only uh, necessary columns, I will show you an example how this looks like. Let's imagine that you're preparing a delicious dinner for your friends. You invited them for a tasty, tasty pizza, but before you make the dish, you have to prepare the ingredients. So what goes into a regular pizza? Uh, let's say pizza bread, tomato sauce, ham, cheese. Maybe you need some extra ingredients for some of your guests, uh, some special guests, such as pineapple or, I don't know, corn, uh, eggs, olives, because as a good host, you want to satisfy all your guests' needs. Okay, the next step, you're going into the local shop to buy all you need for your perfect pizza. But while you're walking through the shelves in the shop, you see a beer. Do you need a beer for pizza? I mean, it's always nice to have a beer, but do you need it for the pizza? Few steps more and you spot a chocolate ice cream. Mm, I like shock ice cream, I really do. But again, do I need it for my pizza? Man, that would be really weird pizza with shock ice cream on it. So, what's the morale of this pizza story? Uh, you should focus on those and only those things you really need. Uh, translated to your Power BI development, you should focus only on data your report users really need. Okay, you can put something extra, such as pineapples on top of our pizza. In some circumstances, when you think that it would bring additional business value to your report or dashboard. But carefully evaluate if that brings more benefit in the final outcome. I mean, would you buy a whole pineapple and put it all over your big pizza if you have only one guest eating pineapple pizza and five others that don't like this taste? Or should you maybe prepare smaller pizza for this one pineapple guest instead without disrupting the main pizza taste? I believe that it's always useful to keep in mind this uh, pizza comparison when you're considering which data to put in your data model. Okay, going back to Deck Studio, True to be said, in our model there are some few more columns which could be dismissed, but let's now focus on other techniques for data model optimization. As you may recall from the previous part of our session, when I was emphasizing uh, the order of importance of parameters that affects uh, the model size, I mentioned that cardinality is number one, so number of distinct values within the column. The rule of thumb is the higher the cardinality of a column, so the more distinct values in it, it's harder for VertiPack to optimally compress the data, especially if you are not working with integer values. Uh, there are multiple techniques for reducing the column cardinality and the most popular one is column splitting. Uh, now I will share with you a few examples of using this technique. Um, so let's go to SQL Server Management Studio and I will show you how this can be done. So you can use uh, division and model operations to reduce the cardinality of the column. You see here on this example how this looks like. Instead of 10 distinct values, we got a column with cardinality of 1 and this one has high cardinality, but uh, we saved some bits per row. So in some scenarios uh, when your fact table has, I don't know, hundreds of millions of rows, that can bring some kind of saving. Uh, the other thing, when you're dealing with decimal values, you can split uh, column values before and after the decimal point. So you see that we are getting two whole number columns with lower cardinality than this one. And finally, if you're dealing with date-time columns, you can separate and store, the, store separately uh, date part and time part of the columns. So this is how it will look like. This will also reduce the overall cardinality. Uh, just one important remark here. If we use the calculated columns to apply data model size optimization techniques, uh, there is no benefit at all, since the original column still has to be stored in the data model at first place before your calculations uh, are applied. 
basically optimization techniques must be performed on the source side uh, in most cases by writing a t-sql statement or within power query editor of course if you're writing custom t-sql code to import the data uh, to your power bi data model just keep in mind that you should perform all necessary transformations uh, in your t-sql logic as the query folding would be broken if you use custom t-sql query and afterward apply additional transformation steps in Power Query Editor. Okay, so I'll show you how to how to uh, uh, reduce the cardinality of uh, different uh, data types. And going back to our data model, since we don't have any decimal values, let's focus on our exact problem and that's optimizing the date TM start UTC column. So there are multiple valid options to optimize this column. The first is to check if your users need granularity higher than day level. In other words, can we remove hours, minutes and seconds from our data? In, let's say, 95% of cases, day level granularity is completely fine and will satisfy all your needs. But without talking to my users, I was examining what savings would this solution bring. So, this is the another one where I just uh, changed data type, I will show you now. I just changed data type from here in fact table, instead of having uh, date time data type I just have date data type and if I connect to DAX Studio from this PBAX file let's see how it looks like okay going to advanced view metrics and if we go to summary tab I will see that now my data model size is 213 megabytes so approximately 15% from what we started from. Uh, Vertipack Analyzer now shows that this column day team start UTC is now yeah almost perfectly perfectly optimized going from I don't know taking uh, almost 9 million cardinality to 1000. Yeah so however it appeared that day level grain was not fine enough and that's the mistake uh, I learned. So always ask your users before you put or you remove something from the data model. So my users needed to analyze figures on our level. Okay, so uh, we can at least get rid of minutes and seconds and that would also decrease the cardinality of the column. So I imported values rounded per hour. How, how I did that, let me show you here. So I'm use, I used the date add built-in t-sql function to just let me show you the logic behind. So instead of having these values, I rounded all chats that started between 30000 and 35959 uh, to 3000000 to starting hour. Okay, so let's see this PBX file. And if I go to Dex Studio from here, and let's see now what Vertipack Analyzer will tell us. Okay, it's 221 megabytes, so it's just 8 megabytes, megabytes more than previously, but we satisfied our users' needs. And also, if you take a look at date TM start UTC column, it's 32,000 uh, cardinality, which is much, much better than almost 9 million. Finally, here, one thing still bothered me, this chat ID column, uh, which occupied almost one third of, of my table. And this is just a surrogate key. Uh, this column, of course, has a cardinality that matches the number of rows of the table, which is quite logical as it is a unique identifier of my original table. However, this column is not used in any of the relationships within my data model. Just to be clear, and I don't want you to, to jump into some quick and incorrect conclusions, we can't simply remove uh, all those, all those uh, columns with... Uh, suffix ID, so if you see this IP address ID, customer ID, user ID, uh, some of them, such as this one I, I show you, they are used as a foreign keys to our dimension tables and therefore they are part of the relationships in our data model. But chat ID column is just a surrogate key and is not being used in any relationship or calculation. Therefore I finally asked myself if there would be any benefit if I keep the chat ID column at all. Uh, and I, I I removed it from from my data model, 
and let's go finally to Deck Studio from this PBX file and see what we have now. Again, let's go to Advanced View Metrics and go to Summary 161 megabytes. 161 megabytes. That's that's astonishing. So I didn't lie to you when I said that I managed to reduce my data mo data model size by 90 percent. If you compare our starting point, which was 1.86 gigs, with the current 161 megs, I'll let you do the math. Uh, one last step to do is to disable auto daytime options, uh, auto daytime in options for data load. Uh, if you're not aware, when you leave auto daytime option checked, it will create a hidden table for every single date field uh, in your data model. Those are the hidden date tables which I show you. Uh, so if you have multiple date fields in, in a table of hundreds of millions of rows, your data model will be bloated with those hidden date tables. Even worse, these tables search for the minimum and maximum date value in your whole data model and create date range between minimum and maximum value. So if it happens that you have something like December 31st, uh, 2099 for the current records, your automatically created date tables will span until that date, even if you don't have any record in your fact table that matches that date. So, of course, working with the dates and importance uh, of having a proper date dimension to handle all your time intelligence calculations should be a topic for a separate session, but I just wanted to give you a quick heads up uh, why you should consider disabling all today time for Power BI desktop files. So how do you do this? Going to File, Options and Settings, Options, and under Data Load, I will uncheck this auto date time. Okay, I do this, and this is uh, one another hand use of of Deck Studio. You can't see these hidden date tables anywhere in Power BI desktop, but once you connect to your data model with Deck Studio, you can see them. Uh, as I show you. So if I go again to Deck Studio and I click on View Metrics, we saved four megabytes more because uh, my date tables were, were not so big. And yeah, so that that's just wow. Starting from 1.86 gigs and going to 157 megs. Uh, okay. To conclude, I've managed to reduce my data model size by almost 90%, applying some quite simple techniques which enables the Vertipack storage engine to perform uh, more optimal compression of the data or by simply removing unnecessary columns. And as I said, this was a real use case which I faced during the last year. So you were just watching like documentary about my Power BI work. Maybe some of you now think, wait, Nikola, why did you waste our time with all this blah blah talk about Vertipack, encoding types, cardinality, etc. What you just shown us is basically just removal of unnecessary columns, nothing special. And you are, I can agree, not completely, but almost completely right. Uh, in 95% of cases when you're performing data model size optimization, simple removal of unnecessary and unused columns will be enough to get the job done. And as I already mentioned, but it's never enough repeating this, that would be your starting point uh, when dealing with data model size optimization. In those remaining 5% of scenarios, you would maybe need to apply some more advanced approaches, uh, such as cardinality reduction, using some of uh, those techniques I've shown you a few minutes ago. Okay, to conclude, uh, here is the list of general rules you should keep in mind when trying to reduce the data model size. Keep only those columns your users need in the report. Just sticking with this one single rule will save you an unbelievable amount of space, I assure you. As you've just seen in our demo, sticking with this one rule helped us to make astonishing savings. Always remember pizza comparison. Try to optimize column cardinality whenever possible. The golden rule here is test, test, test. And if you notice significant benefit from, for example, splitting one column into two or substituting decimal column with two whole number columns, then do it. But also keep in mind that your measures need to be rewritten to handle those structural changes uh, in order to display expected results. So if your table is not so big or if you have to rewrite, I don't know, hundreds of measures, maybe it's not worth splitting the column. 
Uh, as I said, it depends on your specific scenario and you should carefully evaluate uh, which solution makes, sen makes more sense for you. Same as for columns, skip only those rows you need. Uh, for example, maybe you don't need to import data from the last 10 years, but only 5. That will also reduce your data model size. Uh, talk to your users, ask them what they really need before blindly put everything inside your data model. Aggregate your data whenever possible. That means fewer rows, lower cardinality, so all nice things we are aiming to achieve. If you don't need hours, minutes or seconds level of granularity, then don't import them. Uh, aggregations in Power BI and tabular model in general are a very important and wide topic, which is obviously out of scope of this session. But there are some really, really awesome resources on the web and I strongly recommend reading a blog series uh, on creative aggregations from Phil Simark on dex.tips. Avoid using calculated columns whenever possible, since they are not being optimally compressed. Instead, try to push all your calculations to a data source, like SQL Database, for example, or perform them using the Power Query Editor. Use proper data types. Uh, for example, if your data granularity is on a day level, there is really no need to use date time data type for your columns. In those, uh, in those circumstances, plain old date data type will be completely fine. And finally, disable auto date time option for data loading, as this will remove a bunch of automatically created date tables in the background. Okay, folks, looking forward to hearing your questions in case that there is not enough time to answer all of them, or if we don't know the answer right now, I will try to collect the questions and get back with the answers. Once more, before I wish you a nice evening and good night, depending on which part of the world you are, I would like to thank you for attending this session and listening to my story. Hope that you enjoyed it and got some better understanding of what is going on behind the scenes in Power BI while being kind of entertained at the same time. I also hope that you will now more appreciate the hard work which Vertipack performs uh, in order to make our Power BI reports lightning fast. Finally, I believe that while watching my demo, you've got inspiration to optimize your own Power BI data models. Trust me, it's not complicated. Simply follow the rules from the session summary and I assure you that your models uh, would be much, much better fit for your reports. Uh, thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of Scottish Summit and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.